the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical Psychology for Today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, voiced by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. In this edition of the podcast, we will hear selections from The Sufis by Idris Shah. This audio has been made available by the Idris Shah Foundation. The Teacher, the Teaching, the Taught By yourself you can do nothing. Seek a friend. If you could taste the slightest bit of your insipidity, you would recoil from it. Nizami, Treasury of Mysteries It is often said that the mentality of the Oriental is such that he will readily place himself under the instruction of a teacher and will follow directions with an obedience which is rare in the West. To anyone who has any real experience of the East, this belief is as erroneous as other Western generalization, that all Eastern countries are more or less the same. The most that can be said about Eastern attitudes towards spiritual teachers is that there are more teachers available and also more evidence that they are doing some good. Almost all human beings are reared with some measure of self-reliance, which becomes a habit of thought. Through a quite natural lack of true reasoning, the idea of accepting guidance becomes confused with a loss of freedom. Most people, in East and West alike, do not realize that putting oneself in the hands of an expert implies no loss of personal importance. Inconsistently, they will allow a surgeon to remove their appendixes, but will dispute the superior knowledge or experience of a teacher in a field in which they are as ignorant as in surgery. Since the Sufis do not preach or try to attract followers, Material relating to the approach to a teacher is only found in the statements of developed Sufis, and generally not from those who are themselves teachers. You go to the priest, says one, from habit or belief, and because he affirms certain things. You visit the doctor because you have been recommended to him, or because you have a sense of urgency or desperation. You frequent the company of magicians because of an inner weakness the swordsmith because of an outer strength, the shoemaker because you have seen his wares and want to possess yourself of some. Do not visit the Sufi unless you want to benefit, for he will drive you forth if you start to dispute. The Sufi belief is that the attraction of a Sufi teacher is essentially because of intuitive recognition. The reasons which the would-be Sufi gives are secondary, rationalization. One Sufi says, I knew the master was a great and good man before I met him, but only when he brought enlightenment to me did I realize his greatness and goodness to be of a far greater order, far beyond my initial capacity to understand. The sense of freedom and the reverse tends to be a subjective one in the ordinary man. A Sufi records, my teacher liberated me from the captivity in which I was, the captivity in which I thought I was free, when in fact I was actually revolving within a pattern. The uncritical carryover of the sense of self-reliance into fields where it does not in fact operate is illustrated in this autobiographical fragment from a Sufi. I resolved that I should tread the mystic path alone, and struggled to do so, until an inner voice said to me, You go to a pathfinder to show you a road through a wilderness, or will you prefer to seek your own way and destroy yourself in the process? The individual reared in a Western cultural setting is often at a disadvantage when faced with the problem of learning, because of his preoccupation with the question of dominate or be dominated, to which he gives intense and undiscriminating emphasis. He is often aware of the problem only in the crude form, 
dominate or be dominated, and his literary and philosophical roots give him little ability to realise that the problem is centred around the assumption that there is no more rarefied possibility than struggle or be struggled against. Some Western observers have noticed this essential crisis. Under the heading of Non-Rational Concern, the editors of a recent symposium, A. E. Biedemann and H. Zimmer, Editors, The Manipulation of Human Behaviour, New York, 1961, page 4, refer to this inherent characteristic. The inability to make others fulfil one's wishes, and the reverse, the fear of being controlled by others, with the consequent loss of the autonomy that is believed to be fundamental to the conception of the self. These opposites are incongruously exaggerated in paranoid thinking, one of the most prevalent mental symptoms of Western man. While some Sufic faculties may develop spontaneously, the Sufi personality cannot mature in solitude, because the seeker does not know exactly which way he is heading, in which order his experiences will come. He is, at the beginning, subject to his own weaknesses, which influence him, and from which a teacher shields him. For this reason, Sheikh Abu al-Hassan Saliba said, Better place a disciple under the control of a cat than under his own control. Just as a cat's impulses are varying and uncontrollable, so are those of the would-be Sufi at an early stage. This parallel of unregenerate man as largely animal, endowed with faculties which he cannot yet properly use, is frequent in Sufi teaching. The more animal the man, the less he understands of teachership. To him the guide may seem like the hunter, requiring him to enter a cage. I was like this, states Ali Peer. The untrained hawk thinks that if he is captured, as he calls it, he will be enslaved. He does not realise that the hawkmaster will give him a fuller life, perched freely on the wrist of the king, without the perpetual preoccupations of food and fear. The only difference between human and animal here is that the animal fears everyone. The human claims that he is assessing the reliability of the teacher. What he is really doing is smothering his intuition, his inclination to place himself in the hands of one who knows the way. There is again an interaction between the teacher and the taught, which can hardly exist if there is no teacher. The Sufi pattern of words, action and cooperation requires three things, the teacher, the learner and the community or school. Rumi refers to this complex of activity when he says, Ilim amozi tarikish kali ast, hafa amozi tarikish fali ast, fakar amozi as sobat kaim ast. Science is learned by words, art by practice, detachment by companionship. And since the very manner of learning must itself be learned, Rumi says in another place, That which is a stone to the ordinary man is a pearl to him who knows. The function of the teacher is to open the mind of the seeker so that he may become accessible to a recognition of his destiny. In order to do this, man must realise how much of his ordinary thinking is cramped by assumptions. Until this point is reached, true understanding is impossible and the candidate is only fit for one or another of the more usual human organisations which train him to think along certain lines. Open the door of your mind to the waif of understanding, for you are poor and it is rich. Rumi Sufism may be viewed in one sense as struggling against the use of words to establish patterns of thinking whereby mankind is kept at a certain stage of ineptitude, or made to serve organisms which are ultimately not of evolutionary value. A Sufi was once asked why the Sufis use words in a special sense, possibly removed from their accustomed significance. 
His answer was, Rather ponder upon why the ordinary man suffers from the tyranny of words, immobilized by custom until they only serve as tools. The relationship between the teacher and the person taught cannot be understood in Sufism apart from the teaching. A part of the teaching stands outside time and space. This corresponds to the element in the teacher and the learner which has a similar status. A part of the teaching is within all of the many aspects into which the ordinary human consciousness splits up experience, life and the world of forms. An interaction of a special kind is producing a transformation. This relationship, therefore, far transcends in ultimate meaning the usual scope of teaching and learning. The Sufi teacher is more than one who is passing on formal knowledge, more than one who is in a state of harmony with the learner, more than a machine which imparts a portion of a stock of information that is available in stored form. And he is teaching more than a method of thinking or an attitude to life more even than a potentiality to self-development. The Czech professor Eric Heller, in his preface to a book which rapidly became a classic of teaching in the mid-20th century, touches on the problem of studying literature, and especially of teaching it. He says that the teacher is involved in a task which would appear impossible by the standards of the scientific laboratory, to teach what, strictly speaking, cannot be taught, but only caught, like a passion, a vice, or a virtue. The Disinherited Mind, London, 1952. The function of the Sufi teacher is even more complex than this. Unlike the teacher of literature, however, he has no task in the usual sense of the word. His task is in being, being himself and it is through the proper functioning of that being that his meaning is projected. Thus it is that there is no division in the public and private personality of the Sufi teacher. He who has one face in the classroom and another at home, who has a professional attitude or a bedside manner, is not a Sufi. This consistency, however, is within himself. His external behaviour may very well appear to change, but his inner personality is unified. The actor, who gets into the skin of the part, cannot be a Sufi teacher. The man or woman whose official face runs away with him, so that he is carried away by a temporary personality, cannot be a Sufi teacher. One does not have to be as advanced a case as Walter Mitty, the creation of James Thurber, to experience involvement a state which is possible only to those at a low level of Sufi awareness. Teachership cannot come through anyone prone to temporary possession by a character. Yet, so firmly established in the ordinary man is the habit of alternating personality that it is socially accepted to act a part. In a very large proportion of instances of this standard social procedure, there is a carryover of the synthetic or alternate personality. This is not in itself considered to be an evil. It is undoubtedly an indication of immaturity in the Sufic sense. This inner unification of personality, expressed through a diversity of ways, means that the Sufi teacher does not resemble the outer, idealized personality of the literalist. The calm, never changing personality, the aloof master, or the personality which inspires awe alone, the man who never varies, cannot be a Sufi master. The ascetic who has attained detachment from things of the world and is thus himself an externalized incarnation of what seems to the externalist to be detached is not a Sufi master. The reason is not far to seek. That which is static becomes useless in the organic sense. A person who is always, as far as can be ascertained, calm and collected, has been trained to have this function, the function of detachment. He never shows agitation, 
and by depriving himself of one of the functions of organic as well as mental life, he has reduced his range of activity. The overtrained becomes muscle-bound. Detachment, for the Sufi, is a part, only a portion of dynamic interchange. Sufism works by alternation. Detachment of intellect is useful only if it enables the practitioner to do something as a result. It cannot be an end in itself in any system which is dealing with humanity's self-realization. In partial or derelict metaphysical systems, of course, the means has become an end. The attaining of detachment or immobility or benignity, which are all parts of any individual's development, are considered to be so strange or desirable in themselves and so rarely attainable that the practitioner settles for them. A further development comes when rationalizations are provided intended to prove that the attainment of detachment or asceticism or any of the other partial developments has some sort of sublime or infinite meaning. So-and-so attained complete detachment and as a result he was supremely enlightened and much more of this becomes the legend. Of course the one does not follow from the other but somehow it seems to follow. In Western Europe you will hear, from otherwise quite sensible people, such non-sequiturs as So-and-so is wonderful, he can control his heartbeat. I always go to him for advice about my personal problems. If the same person were told So-and-so is wonderful, he can type 90 words a minute, take your problems to him, the reaction would be instant indignation. A person can only teach in the metaphysical area and giving him the benefit of any doubt about sincerity what he actually believes to be true. If he teaches you that through standing on your head you will reach some sort of mystical goal, he must first arouse in you some degree of belief that it has already been attained by this method. This is what might be called positive affirmation and may be accepted or rejected the Sufi teaching method embraces a wider field. By drawing attention to other points of view than conventional ones, and by practicing a complex of activities collectively termed Sufism, the teacher endeavours to make available to the learner the materials which will develop his consciousness. His procedure, as Sir Richard Burton remarks, may even appear to be destructive, but is essentially reconstructive. Rumi refers to this factor when he talks about pulling down a house in order to find a treasure. A man does not want his house pulled down, even though the treasure is of greater use to him than the building for which, for the purposes of this illustration we may assume this, he has no special affection. The treasure, as Rumi says, is the reward of the pulling down of the house. It is not a matter of being compelled to break eggs before an omelette can be made but of the eggs doing their own breaking in order to be able to aspire to omelettehood. The guide, philosopher and friend who is the Sufi teacher then performs what may be considered to be many functions. As a guide he shows the way, but the aspirant must himself do the walking. As a philosopher he loves wisdom, in the original meaning of the term. But love to him implies action, not merely enjoyment or even the despair of one-sided love. As a friend, he is a companion and adviser, provides reassurance and a point of view which is influenced by his perception of the other's needs. The Sufi teacher is the link between the disciple and the goal. He embodies and symbolises both the work itself, of which he is a product, and also the continuity of the system, the chain of transmission. Just as the army officer symbolises, for practical purposes, the state and its objectives for the private soldier, so the Sufi symbolises the tariqa, the wholeness of the Sufi entity. The Sufi teacher cannot be an earth-shaking personality who attracts millions of adherents and whose fame reverberates into every corner of the earth. 
His stage of illumination is visible for the most part only to the enlightened. Like a radio receiving apparatus, the human being can perceive only those physical and metaphysical qualities which are within his range. Therefore, the man or woman who is bemused and impressed by the personality of a teacher will be the person whose awareness is insufficient to handle the impact and make use of it. The fuse may not blow but the element becomes destructively or inefficiently incandescent. A blade of grass cannot pierce a mountain. If the sun that illumines the world were to draw nigher, the world would be consumed. Rumi, Mathnavi, Book 1, Winfield's Version The evolving man can only glimpse the qualities of the stage next above him. Obviously, even on the physical analogy, the generality of people cannot even perceive the real qualities of the sage, the man of the fourth stage of Sufic development, when they are at the first or second stage. The comparison which is used by Sufis is this. A little light is useful to the bat. The brilliance of the sun is useless to him, even though he may become intoxicated by it. The so-called free or rational mind, when approaching problems of teachership, makes the most amazing assumptions. A person who says, I will follow someone who satisfies me that he is genuine, is only saying, together with the savage, if a person appears to me to have strange powers, or otherwise defeats my mechanism of assessment, I shall be prepared to obey him. Such a person is useful to the jungle witch doctor who has just imported miraculous magnesium flares from Germany, but he is of little use to himself. Still less use is he to the Sufi cause, because he is not ready for truth, however ready he may be for bewilderment. He must have intuitive capacity for recognizing truth. A man came to Libnani, a Sufi teacher, while I was sitting with him and this interchange took place. Man, I wish to learn. Will you teach me? Libnani, I do not feel that you know how to learn. Man, can you teach me how to learn? Libnani, can you learn how to let me teach? The variety of teachers is enormous in Sufism partly because they consider themselves to be a part of an organic process. This means that their impact upon humanity may be taking place without any consciousness on the part of humanity of the relationship. As one example, the Sufi of the Middle Ages might move from place to place dressed in a patchwork garment and teach by signs, perhaps not speaking, perhaps saying cryptic words. He established no formal school himself, but made sure that the message of Sufihood was communicated to people in the countries through which he passed. This strange figure is known to have operated in Spain and elsewhere in Europe. The name given the silent teacher who performed strange movements, incidentally, was Aglak. Plural Aglakin, pronounced with guttural R and European Q, as Arlequin, Arlequin. This is an Arabic play upon the words for great door and confused speech. There can be little doubt that his appearance to the uninitiated is perpetuated in the Harlequin. A Sufi adept may dress in a patchwork coat or in ordinary clothes. He may be young or old. Hujriri mentions an encounter with a youthful teacher of this kind. A man who wanted to learn about Sufism saw the youth dressed as an adept, but with an ink bottle at his side. He thought that this was unusual, for Sufis are not scribes. He approached the imposter, whom he took to be a scribe profiting from the repute of the patchwork robe, and asked him what Sufism was. Sufism was the answer, is not to think that because a man carries a pot of ink, he is not a Sufi. 
While a Sufi may attain illumination within a long or a short time, he cannot actually teach until he has received the robe of permission to enroll students from his own mentor. And by no means are all Sufis material for teachership. The esoteric interpretation of a certain joke sums this up. Nim Hakim Khatre Jan, Nim Mullah Khatre Iman. The half physician is a danger to life, the half priest is a threat to faith. The half Sufi, in this sense, may be a man who is liberated from the need for being himself a disciple, but who has to continue along the way himself to the final attainment. Being preoccupied with his own development, he cannot teach. The teacher is referred to as the sage, Arif, guide, Murshid, elder, Pir, or sheikh, leader or chief. A great many other words are used, in different shades of meaning denoting the precise nature of the relationship between members of a group and their teacher. There are three routes which can be indicated by the teacher for the postulant. In most Sufi systems, the beginner goes through a novitiate of a thousand and one days, in which his ability to receive instruction is assessed and increased. If he does not fulfil this period, which may be figurative and consist of another period of days, he will have to leave the precincts of the school or madrasa. The second route is when the teacher accepts an applicant directly, without having him attend the general assemblies of the group or circle, halka or daira, and gives him special exercises to perform in concert with himself and independently. The third route is when, after assessing the capabilities of the student, the teacher accepts him formally, but sends him to another teacher who specialises in the exercise which will more directly benefit him. Only the teachers of certain schools supply all the exercises which might be indicated, generally the schools of Central Asia, and especially the Naqshbandi element called the Azamiya, who incorporate numerous teaching methods in a form of overlap procedure. Such teachers have a combined method which is centred within their inner circle, technically termed the Markaz, centrifuge, centre of a circle, headquarters. A session of Sufis performing such exercises is referred to as a Markaz, though when not actually engaged in exercises, they might be termed a Majlis, a session. All Sufi teachings being disposed toward multiple meaning, depending upon how much or on what level the individual can grasp them, there are many allusions in literature to the role of the teacher which are sometimes translated literally. Rumi, as an instance, says, The worker is concealed in the workshop. This is generally taken to refer to the imminence of God. In the theological sense this is completely true, and like all Sufi teachings, it is considered to convey objective truth. This means that it is true in every possible interpretation. Insofar as it is applied to teachership, however, it means that the Sufi guide is a part of the work, as well as the teacher of the Sufis. The whole process, teacher, teaching and taught, is a single phenomenon. The implicit consequence that teachership cannot be studied in isolation where the Sufis are concerned is considered a central fact of high initiatory importance. The would-be student of the Sufis may not be able or inclined to grasp it, but unless the Sufi grasps it, he cannot be a Sufi at all. For this reason, the function and character of the Sufi teacher is always allowed to grow in the perception by means of such material as has been assembled above, together with the actual practice of Sufism. Professor A. J. Arbery of Cambridge, who has approached Sufism from a consistently sympathetic, academic viewpoint, shows the difficulties which have to be faced by the externalist or intellectual worker, the 
obscurity of a doctrine based largely on the experiences in their very nature well-nigh incommunicable. Arbery, Tales from the Masnavi, London, 1961, page 19. I was present one day when a Sufi sheikh in the Near East was being closely questioned by a foreign student of the occult, who was desperate to know how he could recognize a Sufi teacher, and whether the Sufis had any messianic legends foreshadowing the possibility of a guide who would bring people back to metaphysical awareness. You yourself are destined to be a leader of this sort, said the sheikh, and Eastern mystics will be prominent in your life. Keep faith. Later he turned to his disciples and said, That was what he came here for. Do you refuse a child a sweetmeat, or tell a lunatic that he is insane? It is not our function to rehabilitate the ineducable. When a man says, How do you like my new coat? You must not say, It is horrible, unless you can manage to give him a better one, or to teach him better taste in dress. Some people cannot be taught. Rumi said, You cannot teach by disagreement. This podcast is copyright 2016, the Idris Shah Foundation.